Hello, everyone. Uh, so we are at the top of the half hour, I guess you would call it. Um, so welcome to our most recent next current lunchtime lecture. Uh, I'm Grace, the communications manager for the Washington Square Park Conservancy. Uh, before I hand things off to Cheryl, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions, uh, you can use the Q&A or the webinar chat to ask those questions. We'll hold them for the end, but you can submit them at any time. Um, if you're looking for those, uh, if you're on a computer that's at the bottom of your screen, there's a little bar that pops up that says chat or Q&A. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, you're going to want to look for those three dots. Click on those and you'll get to those other options. Um, and uh, we are recording this, so if you want to watch it again later or share it with a friend, uh, it'll be available on our YouTube page and we will email it out. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cheryl. Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, actually, I know you're still listening, so if you could just... Um, uh, do the uh, quick tutorial about how to make the slides as big as you can on your personal machine. I have them full screen here. <laughs> of course I can. Actually, I can do one better. Uh, or yes, so if you are uh, in, uh, actually Cheryl, I think because you're screen sharing, it should be up for everyone. Um, so if you're not seeing Cheryl's uh, full screen, you're going to want to go in the top of your computer screen or the top of your screen, there's something that says view options, and you'll want to have it be either fit to window or 100% original size. Um, and if you want to exit out of full screen for any reason, that control is there as well. Great. Thank you so much, Grace. <laughs> um, lots of detailed photos um, for, uh, for this particular uh, webinar. So I want to make sure that uh, everyone has, uh, has can see as big as possible. I tried to make the photos as big as possible. Um, so today we are talking about the uh, renovation uh, or restoration uh, of the arch that took place really from 2001 to 2004, um, and with a few additional steps taken later, <laughs> but it was undertaken by the New York City Parks Department um, with, uh, with capital funds from the city, as well as some uh, private funding for uh, some research. And what um, this renovation was meant to address was just years and years of, of damage, um, uh, and uh, and the issues that uh, were kind of prominent were to fix a leaking roof, um, conservation efforts for the statuary and the carved pieces on the arch, um, general cleaning um, of the whole of the arch to address uh, prior graffiti and graffiti ghosting, um, uh, biological growth, iron staining, staining, and even some um, some previous remedia remediation efforts that. Um, were not entirely successful, um, and also a new lighting plan. So um, I used uh, several sources for my talk today, um, particularly uh, an arch conservation treatment report um, put together by um, one of the firms involved in the, uh, in the uh, 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 conservation planning um, and then actual work, um, an archaeology report that the uh, Parks Department commissioned uh, during this time, um, reports from various contractors who worked on the arch, and then also ongoing conversations with um, New York City Parks uh, Director of Preservation and the Director of Arts and Antiquities, which also leads um, something called the Monuments Team that we'll talk about a little bit later on today. So, um, so planning was underway for quite some time um, for this uh, renovation, and work didn't begin um, uh, really, until, but work didn't begin until uh, 2001 not, in October, and I just want to um, remind you of 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 the of of the arch kind of prior to uh, 2001. Um, it's it's what it looked like. Um, obviously, you see the the trade tips, trade towers in the background. Um, but at this time, basically, uh, a photographic survey was undertaken. Um, and then also documentation and research was conducted um, on the arch's history um, and pr uh, previous treatments um, by the New York City Parks Department. Um, in November of 2001, a panel of masonry experts were called together. And this was thanks to a grant from the Samuel H. 
Press Foundation, um, and we can thank the um, director of uh, excuse me the director of arts and antiquities for uh, at NYC Parks uh, to make that happen. He's also a villager. Um, so um, they really found that the extent of the deterioration um, was great enough that it seemed to, ex and I'm quoting, extend beyond the physical to become a metaphoric symbol of decay, an image counter to the memorial's purpose. Um, and what they wanted to, they developed a set of goals um, at this conference and they really minimized, uh, they really emphasized minimal intervention. So using the least aggressive measures to achieve the kind of the most successful conservation results, they didn't want to um, erase years of damage, but they wanted to make sure that the, um, that the arch, that the, excuse me, that the carvings, that the statuary were still kind of, um, were still kind of visible um, in, uh, and, uh, and as they were meant uh, to be. Um, so um, I just want to point out before I move, um, before I move from this picture, because I'd like to talk about what the, um, what the restoration kind of uh, addressed. Um, and uh, you can see on the bottom here of this image, the, um, the painted um, bottom portion, uh, and that was meant to address repeated graffiti, um, which it wasn't really a great strategy. So we'll come back to that. Um, so um, the arch was suffering from um, weathering, uh, pollution, uh, water seepage, uh, roosting birds, vandalism, and unfortunately inappropriate treatments um, <laughs> over the years. Um, and it really um, eroded uh, the masonry surface. Um, and in some cases, what they called a complete loss of the sculptural elements. Okay, there were a lot of specialists who played a role in this project. There were uh, outdoor sculptural conservators, art historian, archeologist, architects, a master carver, um, a masonry repair specialist and also a working foreman. Um, and uh, so uh, just a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge uh, went into uh, <laughs> this, uh, this restoration. And, um, uh, and you'll excuse me as I go through, um, I am not a stonemason. Um, I'm, I'm not a stone conservator. Um, I'm gonna try and take some of their, you know, words and their reports and put it in, you know, regular people's language uh, for me and you who, you know, don't necessarily know this material um, uh, as well as, as, as these, these folks. Um, so um, the, uh, the actual restoration um, took place from uh, 2002 to 2004. Um, and you can see uh, here that scaffolding is uh, beginning to be erected. And then you'll see um, both the north side on the left hand side of your screen and the south side on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, besides the scaffolding, netting was added around the whole arch. Um, this was also to protect the surrounding environment um, just from the dust and some of the chemicals uh, that they would be used in the cleaning and, uh, and repair. And they did spend after each day they would spend time cleaning just to um, mitigation in terms of environmental impact. Um, so, um, so the scaffolding was erected. Um, I don't really have good pictures of this, but the, um, the, the roof and the interior were uh, both updated. So uh, a waterproof membrane was added um, on top on the roof of the arch. And there is a hatch which leads from um, kind of that top area that you see behind, you can just make out the eagles in this picture. Um, there's an open area there. Um, uh, the stone was brushed to remove crystalline salt. Um, but the conservators suspected that, um, that there was moisture really deep in the stone. Um, and they uh, assumed that um, in another 10, 20, 30 years that it would need to be redone. Now the carved stone um, uh, underwent uh, significant repair. Um, so I just wanna give you uh, uh, end cleaning. Um, I just want to give you a, uh, a technical term here. Um, so a number of Dutchman repairs were done across the, um, the stone carving, um, the 
the ashlar, we'll get to that, um, and, the, uh, and the statuary. Um, so a Dutchman repair is basically an inset um, uh, where you've uh, replaced basically a fault in the stone with new stone material, um, usually trying to match as much as possible the, the adjacent material. So um, it's, it's, it's literally like a either something that goes in between two pieces of stone or um, in the case of the eagles that you see um, here, um, um, a full repair of something that had, had cracked. Um, so uh, uh, Dutchman repairs were made to, the, um, to three out of the four acanthus leaves um, at the corners. And you can see uh, the circle over to the, um, uh, over to the uh, right hand side of your screen. And then also the, on the, this is the South Eagle, the West um, uh, leg of the South Eagle. Um, also the sword handle on the North, uh, on the Northwest trophy panel. So that is like the federal seal. Um, and then um, portions of the globe at the feet of the angel figures in the spandrel. So you can see here, um, you can see some repair here, and then also, I didn't circle it, I'm sorry, in the globe as well. Um, so that is the, um, some of the, the carvings. Now, what's really fun um, is that um, the arch is constructed of Tuckahoe marble, and that quarry, uh, which is just um, in Tuckahoe, New York, just you know, in Westchester, just north of the city, um, it's been long closed. So I told you at the beginning of that panel that, um, that got together of all those all those very uh, important people. Um, somebody on that panel located rubble um, that was um, in the uh, the rail bed of the Tuckahoe train station. That was Tuckahoe marble. Now it was um, the material was rubble, meaning I mean the pieces are fairly big, but not big enough to uh, to do large pieces of stone. But it worked for these carvings uh, across the. Uh, across the arch that needed these repairs. Okay, so um, another, uh, another piece that the, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, here's cleaning um, of some of the, uh, and this is near the roof line, you can see the cornice here. And then I also wanted to just um, talk about the ashlar. So ashlar, this is another technical term. Um, this is worked stone, so stone that is made to be all one size and um, all one consistency across the front. Um, it's laid almost always in horizontal courses or layers. Um, as you can see, um, kind of I've circled, you can see the shadow of this person, but I'm circling the stone um, here. Um, all of these were cleaned. Um, there were some mortar joints that needed to be repaired. You can see the, just like you would lay in tile, you can see right here um, where the mortar is. Um, there was significant damage, particularly um, along the cornice. Um, and uh, the, the Tuckahoe that was discovered um, in the uh, train um, uh, rail bed um, near the train station uh, was not enough. And so they sourced white Georgia marble, um, which is basically the closest um, uh, commercially available match um, for Tuckahoe um, for any of the Dutchman repairs on the Ashlar. Um, there were also some significant cracks in this stone. Um, if they didn't need to be replaced, they were stabilized with epoxy injections um, and insertions of stainless steel pins. So anything where uh, there was worry that the, uh, that the, um, that the stone could crack further and uh, cause you know, instability, um, those, were, those were filled. Okay, and probably, I think when we think of uh, the arch, you know, we think very, very highly of the statuary. And there was some significant repairs done of the statu statuaries. Um, they, and I think I liked this picture because you can particularly see the biological growth um, occurring on the stone in this picture um, of of uh, Washington accompanied by Wisdom and Justice um, by Alexander Sterling Calder. Um, you can see here um, near his uh, left, or it would be his right leg, um, but what, what, what we're seeing on the left side. Um, and then also beneath his feet here, you can see that biological growth. Um, this um, this uh, particular um, 
statue needed uh, a little bit more work than um, uh, Washington uh, accompanied by fame and valor on the left or East Plinth. Um, you can see particularly uh, in the chin area um, how much loss was here um, and what the reports and um, my conversations with um, the folks at parks tell me is they really wanted to um, they didn't want to try and cover up too much damage, but they did want to make sure that the figures were legible still. And they felt that um, George, this wasn't legible as George Washington anymore. Um, and so um, some, some uh, you know, everything they did try to, um, you know, kind of go on the side of less intervention, but still make sure that the statue kind of evinced what George Washington was when he was first there. And so, um, Thanks to um, Evergreen, um, excuse me, make sure I get their name correct. Um, Evergreen Architectural Arts, we have this really fun, um, oh, excuse me, here's some, um, here's some cleaning notes. Um, so how they were going to clean, so you can see some, um, there was lasers used. Right. Um, there's some chemicals used up top and just water um, in certain places below. Um, everything was marked. Um, and you can see here, um, again, thanks to Evergreen Architectural Arts, this, um, this kind of reestablishment of, of Washington's face as something recognizable um, as Washington. So this is the after picture. And then here is the whole statue in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in 2004 following the conservation. Um, so someone is, sorry, I, I, I I paid attention to the chat, which I try not to do because it takes my concentration away, but um, Alexander Sterling Calder is the sculptor uh, of um, Washington, uh, accompanied by wisdom and justice. Um, thank you, Richard, for pointing that out. Um, and um, Washington, accompanied by fame and valor on the, uh, on the East Plinth, um, had uh, cleaning as well. So they, uh, the conservators used um, uh, color guides to um, kind of see um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of cleaning uh, uh, you know uh, what what tone um, were, were, were they trying to get back to so you'll see these uh, these color samples um, next to um, uh, some of the places in the marble throughout the uh, throughout the renovation restoration and this is Washington re Reimagined following the um, following the, the restoration, and this is uh, by Herman McNeil. Um, this is the this is Washington, um, accompanied by fame and valor on the East Plinth. Okay, so um, oh, and I this is what happens when I lose my concentration. I forgot to tell you about um, uh, poor George's, um, and I'm just going to go back for a moment. Um, poor George's uh, hand. Uh, you can see the hand here on the left um, side image, his right hand in the statue. Um, it's rather large. This was a previous uh, renovation. Um, so they uh, attempted to um, extract the hand as just um, as one piece. It uh, crumbled when they uh, when they were uh, when they were completing the work, so they weren't able to save it. But they were able to source a white Dover marble, um, and the Dover um, marble was sourced from White's Marble Quarry in Wingdale, New York, um, and uh, that is where the original stone for this statue was um, was sourced. So the statues were original in Dover Marvel, the arch itself in uh, Tuckahoe. And now following the renovation, some white Georgia marble as well. Okay, so, and you can see the hand. Um, the idea was to uh, try to make it more to scale. Um, the original renovation on the hand uh, was, really, um, was really a bit out of scale. And so now it's a little bit more back to um, uh, what it looked like originally. Okay, so let's move on. Excuse me while I repeat. So let's move on to the rosettes. So the rosettes were um, originally, there are 95 of them, they were originally carved in place by the Pichirilli brothers. Um, again, this is Takahoe marble. Um, so 
I've gotten conflicting reports from different parks resources. So some say that there, uh, that there were a total of 29 full rosettes that needed replacing and four partial partial rosettes that needed replacing. Um, other times I've just heard 45 out of 95 rosettes. Um, so uh, <laughs> all of them were touched though, all of them were cleaned and you can see, um, you can see the, uh, the note about um, what you're going to use to clean uh, this particular rosette here um, in this image. Um, and this image and a lot of the images you see here are from NYC Parks Archive. Um, again, paint needed to be stripped uh, from the arches, and you can see um, them looking at some of like the color of the um, of of the arch and you uh, of the rosettes, and you can see uh, some of the um, some of the disrepair. This would be this would be a partial repair of a rosette, and um, basically what happened was they were uh, a, a number of rosettes were cast, um, you know, full intact rosettes, and they um, and they. Um, so they cast new rosettes and um, they were um, mounted um, with uh, stainless steel pins and, and epoxy adhesives. And you can see um, the, the, the rosette here in the middle is cast um, versus below. You can see the original and you can see the joints between the rosettes, which were obviously um, filled here with, um, with mortar. And here is the uh, the, the uh, full um, ceiling, um, and you can really, I think, see here the um, uh, the full scope of of you know how many were were cast and and um, look very new and shiny, and um, and how many uh, uh, remained original. And I just, it, I'm sorry, this picture is so grainy, um, but I love this picture of uh, former Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe, um, who is inspecting the work here as, as it's coming to a close. But I just love this picture just because it's hard to imagine how this work is undertaken, but thinking about the scaffolding um, in place at the arch, um, it doesn't seem like I would wanna go up there, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to think, um, and that's, that's how the work was completed as well, so um, originally, so it's exciting. Okay, so, um, uh, so besides, uh, before we move on to this next picture, um, netting was added uh, basically around the cornice and the rosettes, basically to discourage birds from roosting, um, and a graffiti sealant was applied to the lower portion uh, of the arch, including the statues, um, because, uh, you know, over time, there have been many graffiti incidents, and um, um, it, it just seemed like a it, there was new, uh, there was new uh, uh, chemical, uh, chemical solutions um, that hadn't existed in the past. And the painting, the continual painting over of the stone um, is not particularly good for it. So, um, okay, so in March of 2004, um, there was an excavation of what are called dry wells, and this was for the new lighting system. Um, anytime we dig uh, in a city park, um, in, in this age, uh, the city engages an archeologist. In this case, the archeologist was Joan Geismar. So she was on site and this is from her report. Again, I apologize for this image. It's an image of an image, so it's a little grainy, but you can see how far they dug for the, um, for the trenches for the lighting. Um, and what she determined in her report was that there was really nothing, like nothing remaining. So, and really that the original construction of the arch was not kind to the archeological resources of this, um, of this area. Um, um, pretty much in um, construction, they did like original construction of the arch, they did uncover um, remains um, from the potter's field. But in this um, case, they did not find anything except um, infill. So um, here are, here, excuse me, Ooh. here is the new lighting system in all its glory. Um, and in um, the mid 2000s, the, um, the lighting system was actually upgraded to, um, to be uh, LED lights. So there are the trench up lights surrounding the arch um, on all sides. And then there's also uh, 
uh, four spotlights, two um, uh, on the inside of the park and, uh, and two um, outside um, on Washington Square North. On the uh, on the north side of Washington Square North, um, those are maintained by um, the Department of Transportation. Um, so all in all, um, this uh, renovation took 2.7 million dollars uh, of, of city money. Um, at this time, there were a few um, there were a few other private supporters that this total does not include, such as the Samuel H. Crest Foundation and a few corporations. Um, but it also um, helped spur. Um, support for the upcoming renovation or what would be the upcoming renovation of Washington Square, um, which began in 2007. Um, and there was also um, at this time through private funds an endowment created. Um, and this endowment has really helped maintain uh, the arch going forward. And I just want to um, talk a little bit because I know people are going to ask about um, the recent graffiti uh, on the arch and the ghosting that you see there. Um, I did want to compare it to uh, this picture on the left, and this picture on the left is the Carol Teller collection from Village Preservation. Um, I just wanted to call that out, um, used thankfully um, with their okay. Um, and um, uh, you can see that there has been political uh, conversation um, in terms of graffiti on the arch. This is just one picture. I could have pulled up many. Um, and I apologize for the bad language, but this was um, during their recent protests. Um, and you know, there was uh, other graffiti on the south side as well, which uh, the monuments team has taken a really, I think, um, fabulous role in helping to, um, in helping to immediately uh, correct. Um, and we have supported them with um, the purchase of cleaning supplies um, and maybe working with them to, um, to work on an additional um, sealant, um, which is actually that graffiti uh, sealant at the lower portion um, is actually coming to its end of life. It's hard to believe that it's, um, it's 15 years out from this run of restoration, um, but there we are. Um, and uh, I, I did mention that endowment, it allows the monuments crew to come out every year for um, both uh, in uh, inspection of the arch, um, uh, which is to make sure that things are as they should be, um, and, um, and also an annual cleaning. Um, they um, usually do this in July. They plan to come this year in the fall. Obviously in June, they spent a lot of time um, at the arch with cleaning. Um, the ghosting you see, I know it's, um, it's, it's a little bit like heartbreaking, but um, they don't want to um, uh, clean that again right now. Um, they want to um, make sure that there's any, if, if, because it can be um, moist, um, they want it to um, kind of start of naturally start coming out of the stone. And so giving it a little bit of a time before they come again um, to clean um, is, is um, considered wise. Um, and they also, um, at that time, plan to add some additional poultices, um, so keeping some material on um, to try and draw out the um, to draw out the paint um, from the graffiti um, uh, will will help as well. But as you can see, there have been past um, many past uh, taggings of the arch, and um, as long as we do it properly. Um, uh, we can kind of keep those kind of older days where things built up for so long <laughs> um, as part of the past and go forward and make sure we're doing regular inspections and cleanings and um, taking care of problems before they really, um, they really surface. So I think I'm, um, oh, I'm at two minutes before the half hour. Um, sorry, this is a, um, we could talk forever on the arch in so many ways. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A or the chat box. Yeah, I was just going to say, Cheryl, I think you're okay going a little long because it doesn't look like we've got any questions or anything. I will tell everyone uh, that I actually have a video of when parks, uh, when the monuments and antiquities came last year to, uh, pressure wash, power wash the fountain. So I will share that with everyone. I'll send that around uh, in an email with the, the video of this as well. It's fun to see. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I hope I shared enough technical terms, but not too many to make your head spin. Um, the stonemasonry profession is um, incredibly talented. Um, you know, the, 
there have been, since this renovation, there have been um, a considerable amount of, of upgrades. Like I mentioned, the changing the lights to LED lighting um, in those trenches. And you can just see one of the light wells there at the bottom of this picture on the right hand side. Um, there, the roof has also been addressed. Again, the roof unfortunately is very sensitive um, and that interior, um, uh, any interior water really um, uh, uh, is, is, is not good for, uh, for the stone. So um, maintaining that roof is, is really important. And uh, one of the um, dental molding pieces here um, uh, also um, just fell off um, in uh, 2012 um, and they replaced it in a similar way um, with some of that saved Tuckahoe marble um, and with epoxy and stainless steel pins. Um, and you can see some of the netting here too uh, to keep the, those birds from roosting. All right, well, um, let me just check the Q&A. No questions. We will uh, share this uh, presentation. Um, and thank you so much for joining us here. Um, our next lunch lecture is um, a conversation with one of our greeter volunteers. And that will take place two weeks from now, which is... The 27th. The, thank you, the 27th of August. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, we'd love to have you there. Thank you, everyone.